Today, we're talking about relationships, asking the question, what have been your experiences in building constructive, inspired relationships? What makes them good? What makes them fall apart? Can they be mended? Should they be mended? We'd love to you for uh, we'd love for you to join our conversation by calling us on four one five six six three eight four nine two, or tweeting us at Let's Talk on KWMR. Okay, it's been uh, I think many people's experiences that so many of the problems we have, no matter what area, can often come back to relationships whether it's with our spouse, our lover, our children, our stepchildren, our co-workers at work. I think all of us have experienced challenges there. <laughs> and today we'd like to be looking at what really makes them work and what makes them not work. Mm. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to the t- conversation where we want respect. You know, We want respect in our relationships. But what does that look like? Well, I think in part it comes down to really being present and giving people your undivided attention, which is more and more difficult to do in today's very distracting environment. Mm -hmm. And I think another quality that really helps relationships is checking your personal agenda at the door. A lot of people listen only to respond with what how it applies to them rather than really being present for the other person. And giving space for silence, no matter what the relationship is. People feel uncomfortable often with silence. Mm-hmm. When you sit with that silence, it often gives the other person an opportunity to go deeper, to go further, and to go more honestly. That's different than getting the silent treatment from somebody. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but uh, I think it... Uh, I think it's also good to open up your language instead of always asking with why, but what. And it, by opening up that spaciousness in conversation uh, and not using accusatory words, not words mm. that close in but that open up, can really help us uh, connect with people as opposed to putting yourself in a very competitive situation, which our whole culture encourages. We live in a culture of competition. So you add to that all of the distractions of social media and cell phones and all of the things that in one way connect us, but in other ways pull us further apart. Yeah. Uh, As a young man, I I saw, and I think I still see many times, uh, uh, men, older boys, uh, feeling like they want one kind of relationship with their buddies, you know, that is kind of playing sports or being kind of competitive and joking around, and they're looking for a different kind of relationship with their partner, with their lover or whatever. And mm-hmm. and there, the idea that you're somehow going to like be like with your buddies competing and stuff isn't the same or it doesn't feel the same mm-hmm. or whatever. So I, I think it does matter the kind of relationship we're talking about, right? Yeah, but listening seems to work no matter where you are <laughs> or what the relationship. And it seems to be a big problem. I see people cutting each other off all the time or putting in their thing or, you know, listening in order to put forth what they want to happen and mm. in in, in no matter what the relationship. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. When the other person is talking, you're supposed to be thinking about what you're going to say <laughs> to come back at them. <laughs> well, but I, I'm not very good at relationships, so I'm going to offer examples of what not to do, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Well, so... Um, Donna Sheehan and I co-wrote a book called Seduction Redefined, which was all about relationships. It was partly about our relationship. And uh, and, uh, it was really about empowering women to take the lead in uh, in selecting a partner, in, uh, in choosing, because women are built to choose their partners, whereas men just kind of... We'll take whatever. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, uh, we're not so choosy, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we wrote a book about that a long time ago now. Uh, still I didn't online know that. though, seductionredefined.com. And uh, I got to read that book, and what I like is that you alternated chapters. And what what I <coughs> yeah, could exactly. take from that is that the male perspective and the female perspective is indeed different. Yeah, you know, and mm-hmm. I like the way you brought that out, and you right. brought the balance. There, there's some things I read that suggest that we now need to have total equality in everything. And I think that's sometimes difficult for men to find their 
proper role when women are equal in every sense of the word and every way, and there's no differentiation. And so I see that as sometimes uh, a new challenge, whereas in the old world, when, when men were in charge, it was really easy for men. Then Not when, so easy <laughs> for women. <laughs> no, no, that's true. And then uh, as, as, as the roles were redefined, which happened while I was growing up and while we were married, and then I wanted my, uh, my daughter, the firstborn, to have all the rights and privileges that males had. So I was totally on board with you know, changing that paradigm. Mm-hmm. But in, in th- that, as women became stronger, many men, I think, became confused. <laughs> Well, yeah, change is difficult, but it's difficult for women, too. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's all new to all of us, and it isn't equal doesn't have to mean the same. They can be separate and different, yeah. but equal. And I think all relationships have a give and take. One time, the other one leads and has more power in the relationship, but it's a back and forth. It's a balance. Yeah. It's finding a balance. It's a taking turns. It's it a only- joining of your skills, your of each other's qualities, of each other's traits. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what partnership is supposed to be about, I think, mm-hmm. I would say, mm-hmm. is melding that together. And that's why it's wonderful for partners to share a common, you were saying, a, a common goal, a common to have projects in common that they can use their differing abilities on. Uh, yeah, I, I use the word purpose. I had heard this study that uh, they studied uh, older people and those that got Alzheimer's versus those that didn't. There was a strong correlation to people still having a purpose versus those that could not articulate one. Mm-hmm. And that purpose might be just to support somebody else or to see your grandchild do this or, or you know, finish a job or do something. So having purpose is a drive. And if you share a purpose with your partner or with someone you're in a relationship with, Mm. I think that's a compelling reason. You may not agree on how to get to that result, but at least you're both trying for the same result. Mm. To Mm. me, that builds a lot of strength. Obviously, it's not an essential ingredient, but it it sure helps, I think. Yeah, and I think um, dropping your past has a lot to do with not bringing all the bad experiences that you've gone through Mm. and projecting that into that relationship also uh, a clearing of all of that. And that comes down to what we were talking about before, which is good relationships, really your relationship with the world Mm. begins with your relationship with yourself. Yes. And the more you have knowledge about really who you are, the better you are to be in partnership or the better you are to be a parent. Uh, a worker. A lot of people talk about how very difficult it is now with ch- with with teenage children, for example. And but I think the same thing applies. It's it's the idea of really being present. All of the things we talked about. Mm. But uh, and also, um, I guess I would say it's a le- feeling worthy of partnership or feeling worthy of love in that kind of relationship mm-hmm. that's uh that's a tough one for a lot of people especially women they're it, oh you nailed so it. self-critical you, you nailed it we were, i was just talking to a couple of friends yesterday women friends and uh, the subject came up as i don't believe i stayed in this relationship that was so clearly abusive or mm. just not what it should be why did i do that and why did i stay so long mm. and it's I, myself included, I had a, a very similar situation because on some level I thought that's what I deserved. Mm-hmm. That was a real bust. And uh, when I got divorced, I said, well, I better fall in love with myself <laughs> before I have another relationship because... Good idea. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, yeah. because this is going to be a pattern uh, that will repeat forever until I can have that kind of respect for myself. How can I expect it from other people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, you know, one of the things I think we all crave universally is some attention, some strokes. And, and so even negative ones are better than positive ones. And what we fear the most is the idea that we're not going to get anything. So if we're alone and we're afraid uh, we're not going to get any attention, sometimes I think that motivates people to settle for a less than ideal mm-hmm. uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. But, but clearly, uh, if, if both parties are giving each other some positive strokes, uh, that goes a long way to yeah, building I mean, a relationship. Yeah, I I think it's really important that that you feel that the person you are in relationship with, all the people that you're in relationship, that there's a basic acceptance. Uh, And, of course, as those relationships become more intimate, that there's uh, an unconditional love under everything. And although Mm. we may differ, 
we can get through this because I love you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you think our audience has uh, any experience with relationships? Oh, I hope they do. <laughs> I hope they call in. <laughs> well, this is Let's Talk uh, Radio with host Mary Frank, Bernie Stephan, and I'm Paul Raffel. Please do call in on 415-663-8492 and share your ideas on what makes for good relationships and what causes them to fail. Hmm. That's uh, that's a, a tricky one. How when how to know when to stop what might be a failed relationship? Um, I think I, I I think a real um, flawless clue is how your body is responding and listening to the messages that your body is giving. When you're with this person, do you mm. get a stomach ache? Do you get a <laughs> headache? No, this is this is this is really uh, helpful information. Yeah. Um, do you feel drained after you've been with this person, or do you feel energized? Are you happy to see them, or is it? Oh my God, here we go. So the mm. the the messages in our body are extremely important in helping us determine that. But again. It's increasingly difficult to be in tune. That's why, like, really paying attention to your body with exercise and tuning in, or however anybody does that, is so important because those messages are flawless and they're never wrong. They're your best mm. friends. Like, and if you override those messages, mm. it becomes more and more serious. I had an experience with this. I just was given all kinds of signs. Oh, no, oh, no, it'll be okay. It'll be. No, it won't be okay. Mm. And uh, it's trusting your intuition as well. I yes. Mean, yes. The, yeah. the gut feelings. Yes. Literally, the gut feelings. Yeah. What? Uh, what, what? Oh, I think we, we have, have a, a caller. So, hi, caller. Uh, what's your first name, please? Hi, Martine and Bolinas. Hey, hi, Martine. Thanks for hey. calling. Thanks for the show. It's great. Um, what are your thoughts on relationships? Well, hooray! Let's have some. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, the, about the body, I just want to say I, I was married to somebody uh, and it was very difficult and very painful. And what my body finally did to get my attention was it broke out in hives every single day, and these like t- you know quarter size hives. My whole body it was amazing. Yikes. And then I I got the clue when I went away for a few days, and the hives went away. I thought, hmm, maybe this is related to that relationship. Mm. And indeed, when I got out of the relationship, the hives went away. You know, I had a similar experience to that. <laughs> Yikes. The Last minute I walked year. in the room, boom, I broke out in hives. So, <laughs> and then I also wanted to say, you know, just in terms of being able to communicate, how wonderful being a student of Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication and somebody who works with it a lot. It's truly amazing what it can do for relationships because in our habitual language is embedded so much blame and shame, literally Mm. embedded in the phrases that we take for granted, that we just consider the way to talk, and we don't know when we talk in these ways that we are giving messages of blame and shame. So I've seen over and over again in working with couples when they get some nonviolent communication abilities, they at least can catch themselves when they do this and back up and start over and have have a better way to understand, whoa, what just happened, you know? Um, how, how come we both uh, got upset there rather than blaming each other? Um, really have a way to work through it. So yay for Marshall Rosenberg. Yeah, wonderful tools. BC, great tool. Mm-hmm. And it truly makes relationships and communities uh, work. So That awareness you talk about I, I think is so important. I, I, I feel like oftentimes I'll get in a spiral with somebody where we, we don't mean to, but it's like I, I guess I say something a certain way and that elicits a certain response that gets another response and we get into a vicious circle. So uh, how do we break that? <laughs> right. One way is to stop and take a breath and go, yep. go, whoa, let's just back off here. Let's give ourselves some space. Are you a counselor, a family counselor? I do work with families, couples, and businesses, and 
and yeah, giving some space and letting the neuropeptides settle down. Mm-hmm. Those, no, those <laughs> neuropeptides, when they're cascading, you really cannot communicate effectively. And learning some key phrases like, gee, if I keep talking now, I know I'm just going to say things that aren't going to work for either one of us. Could we take a break? You know, How about time out? And being willing to then self-reflect and go, I wonder why I was so upset. What was going on in me? What wound of mine got stimulated? Not why is my partner such an idiot? You know, that's the first thing that happens when we stop. We, we have all these thoughts of blaming and why they're to blame. And once those have died down, then we can begin to look inside and really inquire what's going on. Anyway, thanks for the program. Well, well thank, thank you so much for being a caller. Comments. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> comments. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Martin. I just have an anecdotal um, story to tell. When I did uh, separate from my partner, I spent, you know, it was a very difficult situation, and I had a friend who I would always dump on. I wouldn't believe what he did now, and you wouldn't believe. Mm. Oh, let's take the caller. I can finish later. Yeah, hi. Uh, You're on the air with KWMR. What's your name, please? Hi. My name is Monique. Hi, Monique. Hi, Monique. Hi there. I'm calling in to um, share and participate in this wonderful topic on relationship. Well, we're glad to have you. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Fairfax. Okay, welcome to the show. Thank you. So this topic, what can I add to this conversation and dialogue that has already been expressed so richly? I love all the the points of views uh, that you have shared, Mary, on um, your personal take on what makes relationships work. And um, what comes to mind for me that I can, I feel like I can add is, uh, two words. I feel like relationships need to be both one authentic mm-hmm. as well as conscious, uh, conscious relationships and and authentic relationships. And um, luckily, there's so many really great tools out there for people to improve on their communication skills, which I feel is one of the most fundamental, most important primary. Um, qualities that make relationships work. Can I ask you what are your what are the tools you you use most or you find the most useful? <clears throat> well, for for communication, uh, um, you mean or just uh, yeah? Do I like I, I with your spouse or your children or whatever? Do you have children? Yes, I have a I have a twelve year old daughter. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's just most most of the time it's just both she and I in our household. So. Um, sometimes there is um, a lot of uh, space, now that she's 12 years old, there's um, a lot less uh, um, communication happening. There's a lot more listening and allowing for um, comfortable silence. And then when there is a need to speak, then we share, which is something my daughter actually teaches me. I feel that a lot of people have different styles of communication. And one of the things that she teaches me is that she's not a, a girl of, like, a, a lot of words. Like, she only usually speaks or, or, you know, makes comments when she feels she has something to say, which is so different from me. I'm, like, constantly sharing my thoughts, <laughs> speaking aloud. Like, the first thought that comes up, I want to let it out. And... Sometimes often I put my foot in my mouth if I'm not like, you know, um, just really conscious of where I want to go with what I want to say. But, um, yeah, my daughter really teaches me the art of listening and um, speaking only when you really need to say something, which I think is quite quite profound for us. Yeah, very impressive. One of the things that comes to my mind as you're speaking, and, and I have a daughter who's late, she's now an adult and she's a mother and great with grandchildren, but there, there, there's a change from when you have that parent-child relationship uh, to when you need to let go and you start having that adult-to-adult relationship with your children. And uh, I think that's difficult for a lot of parents to make that shift. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I think the children often want that. They want to be seen as an equal and be talked to as another adult and not be spoken down to by their parent. And the parent, even when you're 67 years old, sometimes still wants to say, you're my child and that's my job. <laughs> so I think there's a challenge at, uh, at breaking that mold that we start with. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, and I actually just attended one of these uh, parent-teacher school nights where we get educated on, you know, particularly the, to- the topic of how to survive raising a teen. And <laughs> one of the things that the speaker spoke about is m- mostly what's going on for a preteen or a teenage child is like a certain degree of uh, brain development where they are actually operating from um, an emotional aspect of their brain, um, their amygdala, the memory, the mm. emotional part. And what they're operating on is more of like a feeling, sensorial, like so many neurons are going off in, in certain aspects of their brain and so much is expanding that they're operating more from an emotional place and they don't often have the analytical um, developed brain that grown-ups have where we think things through Kids, when they speak, they think they already know the answer, but they actually haven't thought it through because they're actually picking up information from what they're feeling, and it's not a level of maturity yet. So oftentimes, there's, there tends to be a lot of communication breakdown between parents and teens because the brain development in their in their adolescent mind is, is not quite... Um, operating mm-hmm. on all levels. That's a great point. That's a great point. We also call that puberty, don't we? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. It's like this young adolescent trying to figure out, you know, that separation stage where they want to act, exercise their free will, but but they're coming from a different um, aspect of their their human development. Um, so with my so my my daughter, I, it's like constantly I'm learning um, how to listen better as far as becoming a better communicator Mm. and i think humor is also a very important key in what makes relationships thrive is that you know oftentimes when we're charged or something comes up you know there's this this intensity and seriousness that happens that we forget sometimes that you know this this is a lot of Humor is such an important aspect to just letting things go. And mm-hmm. my daughter also teaches me that because, you know, oftentimes when we get into our little nooks of, of intensity, oftentimes what leads in the end is like this breaking down of just laughter. We just end up cracking up and, <laughs> and, and we have this great relief. And I find it so refreshing and I'm so grateful. I don't share that with a lot of relationships in my life. There's maybe a few key people where... I can just be brought to tears from laughing so hard in the end when we like get all riled up about something, and then in the end we like, we end up laughing. Mm. Big medicine laughter. Yeah, I love this. It's this um, quality in a relationship. So I tra- I tend to try to transfer humor into my relationships with people in my everyday life, no matter whether it's you know my colleagues or my partner or you know people I meet on the street. I always remember that humor is so important when it yeah. comes to relating and um, very important and mm-hmm. the intensity of relationship and a sign of emotional health I think mm-hmm. right. absolutely so and, and your life becomes a lot more fun <laughs> yeah it becomes a lot more fun and it's, it's just more rewarding when you started, you mentioned being authentic as an important element. I, I just wanted to go back to that a little bit. Uh, maybe you can give us an example of like what is inauthentic behavior that you've seen. Well, what comes to mind with authenticity, and it's just another viewpoint on um, the reality of relationships, and that is, you know, so much of what we learn in relationships is learned behavior. I'm from another culture, and there's so many different styles of communicating that is relative to the, your cultural upbringing, how you were taught, how you saw your aunties and uncles interacting, you know, people interrupting each other while they speak over each other. And in some cultures, that's actually how they authentically operate. <laughs> yeah. So I feel authenticity is you know, recognizing if somebody's from a different culture, you have to allow for them to just be their authentic self. And then you're being your authentic self based on the tools that you know, your level of consciousness mm-hmm. in communicating to have a, a thriving relationship. And and that's what I was talking about with the humor, too. It's like there's so many different layers to relationships, and um, cultural backgrounds are one of them. And there needs to be an allowance for authenticity Yes. You know, it's Italian, and they want to play around and fling their arms and talk over you. I mean, that's like their cultural 
you know, learned behavior. Excellent point, Monique. Thank you so much for calling in and making such a wonderful contribution to our show. Thank Thanks, you so Monique. much. Yes. Bye bye. And we have another caller. Uh, caller, you're on the air. What's your name, please? Hi. Hi. What's your name, please? My name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. You're on the air. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What a great topic. A lot of people worry about them, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I love what you guys are talking about, and I really appreciate appreciate the topic and love the knowledge and wisdom being shared. And um, I was really loving, I was just listening to the last caller speak and talking about humor. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a really beautiful and important aspect in um and working in relationship and just being in relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and another H word I'm thinking of is honesty and humility. And I find those to be very powerful tools in relationship with oneself and then in relationship with others. And uh, Mary, like what you were saying about um, really having, um, being in love with yourself first. And, you know, having a loving relationship with yourself, I think, is um, really important in in our relationships with others mm-hmm. and um, and having a humility in that mm-hmm. and um, moving from um, often, you know, when we can get in conflict, not only with other people, but in conflict within ourselves, moving from judgment criticism and defense and releasing that and inviting in and exploring compassion and love and um, I find those to be really helpful tools in my business I have a, a coaching practice it's called cooperative family transitions and we coach individuals couples and co-parents in relationship transitions in separation, divorce, and blending families. And um, what really helps in moving through certain uh, conflict loops is um, is being able to step out of the judgment and the defense and moving into a place of compassion and kindness. Mm. And um, so that was just something that I was wanting to add into the conversation. You know, that's that's so, so key, Sarah. Um, you know, you work with families in transition, and I'm wondering, I've just seen so many families where they, where the families come together and are blended, and that seems to be like one of your specialties, that, uh, you know, there's just so many conflicts that arise from that. Do you, do you have any suggestion for that? It seems to be rampant right now. Yeah, so in relation to uh, families who are um, blended families, is that correct? Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't maybe yeah, make that some, clear, yeah. Um, sure, there's so many pieces to that puzzle, and I think one, again, is just coming back to um, letting go of control and, um, and, and, and really just taking care, coming back to ourselves, again, humility, Mm -hmm. um, that we don't have all the answers, that Mm -hmm. we don't know what's right for other people. Um, Kind of like what Monique was saying earlier, everybody has different ways of being and has different ways they were raised or their cultural backgrounds. And um, what I might think um, is appropriate or considered um, a certain way. Um, somebody else may not and may mis, um, uh, mistake my intentions. So I might have good intentions behind a certain action, um, but that action might be misinterpreted because someone else has a different belief system and they may not understand that intention and, and they will have their own projection or perception about that. Mm. So I think a lot of it is coming back to... Um, You know, a lot of it is letting go of expectations, not having expectations, really. I mean, of course, like, you know, there's certain basic level expectations and self-respect and kindness and whatnot. But um, I I want to emphasize another word you uh, said, Sarah, and that was judgments. I think we all make judgments that we're not really even aware of. And and yet they are a form of being critical of how the other person is being. 
And uh, exactly. I think that idea that when we start discovering the, the judgments we make, then we have a chance for uh, maybe changing how we speak to those folks. Yeah, and this is connected to the projection. You know, I think you should be a certain way because that's what I think you should be. Exactly. And, and letting go of that because we all have flaws. We all mess up. And and uh, uh, Tim McGraw in, in the Country Music Awards said, you have to stay humble and kind. Mm. And I think that's a key word, too, here. Sarah, do you have a website you want to promote? I do. It's cooperativefamilytransitions.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your call today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. But we Hi, what's your name, please? Uh, Eleanor, Eleanor Lyman. Hi, Eleanor. Hi there. Well, I wanted to share my findings from a 20-year relationship that I've had, finally, and in my later life, I was able to make a good choice, and I've learned a lot, and I just, so I wanted to share what my findings were that have led to my relationship just blooming and becoming more and more beautiful. Mm. And so one of the things is that uh, years ago, I noticed that when I get tired, uh, my behavior can revert to uh, subtle irritation and uh, kind of put downs even. And so, when I there was a, cer- a turning point for me in our relationship when I realized that I, I, I can't continue to do this because it was like an irritable place where. There was like subtle put downs, you know, or blame or whatever. And um, I realized that I was either going to end the relationship or stop doing it. Mm. And so I have become a very vigilant uh, monitor of my behavior in this way. And when I get tired, I, I, I can, if I name it, it helps. It helps uh, dis- discharge it so that it doesn't turn into behavior that I regret afterwards and have to apologize for. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the keys to what's helped a lot. So go take a nap is one way to time out. Huh? Well, or just pause and, <laughs> yeah. and check in and give yourself and breathe and, you know, and so that's, that's worked real well for me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that's part of being um, in a conscious relationship, right? You're always aware of uh, how you're treating your partner and how what your words mean. If you can be conscious of that at all times, then you're... Yes, yes. And being willing to change, right? I mean... Yes. Uh, also, there are times when one just has to apologize. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> You can't be conscious every minute. Mm. But interestingly enough, our relationship since that time has just bloomed. I mean, it made such a difference to stop doing that. Mm. And so another another key that worked for me that I want to share is, of course, there's the respect thing, which is the big one, and acceptance, uh, acceptance of myself and of him. Uh, and the more I'm able to bring those into practice, the more beautiful our relationship gets. Oh, Boy, those are wonderful uh, words to yeah, offer. Wonderful. Thanks so yeah. much, Eleanor. But, but challenging. So there's one more. Okay. <laughs> and so one of the one of the things that all oh, trip me up a lot in my uh, years uh, is when I feel unloved. When I feel unloved, that can translate into getting angry because you're not getting what you think you need. You know what I mean? I do. <laughs> and so what I do now when I feel unloved is I exaggerate and I bring humor into it. Oh, you do love me just a little, just a <laughs> tiny, tiny little bit, you know, like that. Looks it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you turn it into a joke, and so it doesn't have the negative charge that it can have if you play out those feelings of feeling unloved. Mm-hmm. Very good point. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Great advice. It's wonderful. I, I just oh, like. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for calling in. I just. Oh yes. You're welcome. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. I just like to dovetail on that last point, and that is um, self fulfilling prophecies. A part of this is no, as having a positive attitude, and feeling that this will work out, unless something really horrendous happens, because that's very important. Mm-hmm. And if we if we if we believe that over a long enough period of time, we start to act in ways to prove it to ourselves, 
and this goes for our relationships and for life. So why not expect only the best to happen? And of course, if it doesn't turn out, you acknowledge it and you go on, but coming forth with a positive attitude allows, well, first of all, it allows love to bubble up much more easily. And uh, I think underneath all really close relationships, if you have that feeling of love for yourself and for whoever you love, uh, you progress in a way that is inspired and positive. Well, we've talked about, you know, your, your partner, your lover, uh, children, and uh, maybe touched on friends. But there's other relationships that we have that are unequal power relationships, like the landlord-tenant, like the employer-employee, uh, like the uh, customer and the supplier. I mean, mm. in, in all of those relationships, there's an implied power on one side that the other side doesn't have. And yet... Uh, we need to uh, navigate those as well because our, our world is full of those kinds of relationships. And uh, I've even heard s say that sometimes you need to learn how to manage your boss as opposed to always just having your boss be the, uh, uh, the person who determines all the rules of, of how you engage. Um, uh, is that uh, even more challenging than, than with a partner or is that an easier relationship? typically to manage? Depends on the boss. <laughs> but well, how about the employee? Does it depend it, on it, you? <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's still, but the same principles that we've talked about today, I think apply to really all relationships. Now, when there's an imbalance in power like that, yeah. that calls upon particularly tuned in skills. And my, after living a long time on this planet, is that if you cannot be yourself in a relationship, it's best to step out, even if it's your job. And I know that's very mm. challenging, but, you know, if you, the only thing we really have to be in life, the only thing we have to be is ourself. Huh, yeah. And we have so many challenges uh, threatening that from blooming that the principles of uh, non-judgment and being present and listening and not projecting and not being judgmental, all of this can apply to work. Um, it, it's as not well. though easy in the sense that if you feel that you've got to have this job or else you can't provide for your family, yeah. or you know, we have this in in the employer-employee where taking advantage of that power relationship in a sexual way, there's laws against it for sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that these power relationships can be abused. And mm -hmm. yet the person being abused is often afraid to break it because yes. uh, they think it can even be worse that, that not having any relationship or not having a job or not having someone to provide for me mm -hmm. uh, is a scary thing. So we need to somehow figure out how one can either change that by staying in it and, and, and even from mm -hmm. the less powerful position, maybe affect change that makes it more tolerable. Mm -hmm. Boy. And, learn, and being able to actually recognize that the job is not for you or the place is not for you, uh, but still being able to do that with humility, saying that you know, I'm out of here. I'm better than this. Uh, how do you how do you accomplish that? I, I mean, that's a that's a fine line you're kind well, of Well, it cutting, is. Right? It's like you, a razor's edge. I'm yeah. not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth it. You know, it's like it calls for great skill. I've had very abusive bosses in my life, mm -hmm. and usually I found that the their abuse is really based on fear. Right. Not always, but really enough times that I can say it's pretty much very present in many people who are using their position uh, as a powerful way to abuse people. Let's and and it's way. a way where yeah. they themselves aren't confident in their own behavior. Right. So right. That they're resorting to these tactics yes. to, to stay and in charge. Right? Yeah. I um, Personally, just my personal story with this is I found that if I really started acknowledging that person in any way that I could, either... It could be could be related to work, could be what they're wearing. But if I acknowledge that person, and some would call it sucking up, but it really isn't. It's, it's like not going along with what you don't believe in, but acknowledging what is good about that person. Sure. So that you can stay out of continuous judgment, that that very often is effective in softening those really ridiculous behaviors and humor here we go again you know if we can somehow bring some lightness into it that can shift those things as well but it's 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 delicate 
So, yes, uh, bring some lightness to our conversation. Why this? Hi, caller, you're on the air. What's your name, please? Hi, my name is Johnny Moore. I'm a long-time programmer on KWMR. Hi, Johnny. Oh, Hi, Johnny. Hi, guys. It's great to hear you. I'm a first-time caller on your show. Excellent. And I'm up here in Reading, and I've been doing my laundry this morning and listening to you. <laughs> well, <Wow>. good. <laughs> Uh huh. And so, just before you mentioned the word acknowledgement, uh, I was like tossing this marble around, and what I've noticed is uh, it breaks the ice. It causes a what if you if you have it as a spiral up in contrast to a spiral down of uh, the just the way you're feeling. You know, like when you're reading your feelings. Uh, if you come, if I come up with appreciation and acknowledgement uh, over there, that person can't do anything with that. Hmm. And and one thing they can't do is they can't judge me. They can try to, but it's ineffective because it's, they're two opposing forces, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, so I actually am a great practitioner, a lifelong practitioner of that. And that is, because I just think that opens the door to uh, what you've been speaking about earlier, is once you're present, then, you know, the information that you need to have to be appropriate in the moment with that person, regardless of their situation or the conversation or topic at hand, that the presence of appreciation and acknowledgement truly, somebody told me one time, it was, uh, if you can be in ecstasy about that expression, if you can create the context of ecstasy around that expression that that person is delivering to you, that will provide the heat necessary to melt whatever is there. <laughs> Good point. You're reminding me, I, I took a Dale Carnegie course, you know, the guy that wrote the book long ago about how to win friends and influence sure. people, and uh, he makes several great points. One is that criticism never works, and a lot of people think, oh, it's just, you know, uh, constructive criticism. Well, the truth is people can't take criticism, but they can take compliments and challenges to be your greater self. And he also points out that the sweetest word in the English language to everyone is their first name, so you can always <laughs> start, start with that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so hard, you know, when we're caught up in the, uh, the morass of things, uh, uh, to sometimes you can't remember their name. Mm -hmm. That's where we're, you know, I, I wasn't listening in the first, like Martine was saying, you know, mm. uh, you, you started this thing off with, yeah, you know, like I wasn't really listening in the first place. Right. And, yep. Yeah, and if I can't remember your name, why well, hell, I'm not, I'm not going to get anything done. There's <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not an ounce of thread, sliver of space available. So, Johnny, do we have a relationship now? This is your first call. Are you going to call us again in the future? I will call up again because I am in love with this conversation. Oh, <laughs> fabulous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Let's, let's leave the line open, get another caller, and see what they have to say now. Fantastic. Thank you, Johnny. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Johnny Moore, all the way from Reading. So, yeah, um, acknowledgement, he said. Yeah, that's, I mean, everyone wants to be recognized as a person. Right? Yes, and I mean, everybody wants to be cared for. And everyone everybody wants, wants kindness. Everybody wants it. And, you know, so many of the barriers to it are people who really, really, really want it, and it's not in their lives. Mm. You said something yeah. early on about the uh, liking yourself, and I think the idea that you must actually believe that you're you're worth something yeah. in order to receive the, the compliments and from others. In and, order and, to receive and also yeah. to give, to yeah. genuinely give. So it's not out of neediness or out of agenda, but it's from your heart. Someone may be trying to give you a compliment and trying to be building rapport with you, but if you don't take it in, if you don't accept it, you're somehow rejecting it, and, and you're not allowing that relationship to mm -hmm. develop, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, I, I know that you know in, in business, the idea when you're working with a client or something, the, the essential element is always finding some rapport, finding something in common with that person mm -hmm. uh, as quickly as possible mm -hmm. <laughs> so that you can feel like there's some connection here that we can begin a conversation mm -hmm. on. And that uh, idea of 
finding what you still have rapport with, with the partner that you're having trouble with, <laughs> yeah. it might be a way to come back to, uh, to trying to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a tweet from Murray. Thank you, Murray. Uh, needing to be right causes big problems. We see this in religious wars as well as at the personal level. Uh, yeah, I see it in all wars, and you see it in politics, and you see it in... Uh, Boy, you see it at conventions, don't you? Mm, <laughs> and we have one more caller. Hi, caller. Uh, what's your name, please? Hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. What, what's your thoughts on relationships? Um, I have one. I'm, I've not been in a lot of relationships, but um, I have one key thing I think that um, has not been mentioned, um, and I, I would say that's communicating, so like knowing what you want and what you need at any given moment mm. um, and be being able to say that to whoever you're standing in front of um, if it's your partner if it's your kids if it's whoever that's um, very important yeah. excellent Just expressing that so. being clear about what you're hoping for yeah about what you need in that particular moment and yeah. i can give maybe two examples one is if i've had a really terrible day and i come home and my boyfriend is a really great fixer and sometimes I don't I, I don't need that I need somebody to listen it's mm -hmm. I have to know to let him know that I'm going to rant for like 15 minutes and he, <laughs> to, and he just has to not fix it um, yeah. it's not what I need it's not what I'm looking for that's very um, good I think that's I think that helps. Though that's such a common problem, I understand. I mean, I, I'm a guy who generally doesn't like want to wallow in what, let's say, the woman is is, is wanting to just share emotionally, etc. I want to get to what's the point? What can we do? What's the? Uh, what can I fix? Uh, that's sort of how I engage with people, and I have to learn that uh, that's not always appropriate. That the, mm -hmm. the the person talking to me doesn't necessarily want it fixed, like you're saying. They just want to be listened to. And Louisa, mm -hmm. I, I think that this is such so often a particularly female problem because, you know, we are pleasers. We want to do what the other one wants, whether it's our spouse, our kids, our boss. And, and to be able to, such a good point, to be able to know what you want, express what you want, yeah. um, because, you know, we're not mind readers. We can read some, some signs, but it just really helps when you come forth with how you really feel and think. So true, and and I know that most mostly, uh, I know that. So for me, I I tend to be a fixer too. So if I, with my sister, we have the same thing where she has to tell me, wait, I don't want you to fix this. I just want to be able to get this off of my. Yeah. Off of my well, you be my wall. Yeah, let me vent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that is how different how the difference between men and women. Men just shut down; they just want to go quiet if they've had a bad day. They just mm, <laughs> <laughs> go in the man cave. And uh, yes, and women prefer to uh, let us know exactly what's been going on. You know, there's a physiological yeah. reason for yes. the man cave. When men have, you know, they've gone and been out in the world and been very demanding and blah blah blah. And they need to go into the man cave, whatever that could be, because it builds testosterone. And yeah. there's actually a physiological component to that. Right. So we should be very accepting, I guess, of <laughs> men who need to do that. In because, the den. Yeah, it's, it's a need. And men want to please by fixing things. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. I mean, but I, I like what you said, Lisa, about just being clear about what you're wanting at the, at the time. That makes yeah. so much sense. And it's really yeah. bravo for you. Uh -huh. Thank to, you. Yeah. It's a lot of the pressure off of the other person if you just express what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for Thank your call, you. Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, that's bye -bye. very important advice, that one. And it goes all the way through in, in uh, partner relationships, in life relationships, uh, all the way from waking up in the morning and going to bed at night. Mm -hmm. you, you let the guy know, I say this from the male point of view, women need to let men know what they want. Amen. At all times, especially 
at night. And, uh, <laughs> well, oh, doesn't the guy get to say, this is what I want? Well, yes, he does. <laughs> um, but we already point. know that. <laughs> yeah, you know what you want. <laughs> but we need to be able to, that's a, that's a key part of a relation, of a partnership, is when you're honest with each other and you're not afraid to say, I need this and I need this. And also, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, Donna's, Donna's favorite line favorite advice was Sunday sex. So when you've been in a relationship for quite a while, make appointments for intimacy because otherwise thing life tends to get in the way. And uh, that intimacy, that moment of intimacy is, even if you've made an appointment for it, is uh, very important. In uh, yeah, what that's great so advice. important. It is. <laughs> wonderful advice. Okay, I, I want to thank all our listeners and our callers today for your participation. I hope you'll tune in every Thursday at 11 because your voice really does matter.